Oké, okay, thank you. Uh, well, um, I'm part of the program committee and uh, well, while, while we're trying to find some uh, interesting talks, uh, automation is still coming up as an yeah, interested uh, subject. So we found, uh, don't break it. We found uh, Chris uh, as one of the uh, yeah, persons to uh, respond to uh, our RFP. And uh, well, we are uh, interested in uh, what he uh, can learn us uh, today and teach us. There you go. Good morning. So I know we're running late, and I'm the tank standing between you and lunch. But given that it's going to be together with Ganamel anyhow, who cares? <laughs> I'm from Belgium, so I get to make these jokes about the Dutch not having meeting culture, not having beer. <laughs> oh, we do have beer now. <laughs> you don't even sound Dutch. <laughs> we have a special province that Dutch beer. Um, anyhow. Today I'm going to talk about continuous delivery of your infrastructure. Um, I can imagine a couple of you have already seen a bunch of slides of these presentations. Uh, I've been talking at NLU, G events, and lots of other Linux and open source conferences for the past decade and a half, I guess. Um, before that, I actually did software development. Um, I also was a smart guy who wanted a booking to come in all crappy languages like Perl and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I went from doing development to doing operations, and basically I'm back where I came from, because now we're doing automated infrastructure, and I'm writing the code to build the infrastructures we run on today. My day-to-day -day role is basically being one of the senior people at Inwix.eu. Uh, for those who don't know us, there's one guy standing in the back, Daniel, sipping his coffee, wearing a Miser Kinga t-shirt, and there's a couple of other people who are going to join later. There's one in the audience. Um, and what we do is helping people to deliver their infrastructure, delivering applications with open source software. Um, within that world, somewhere along the line, I had the opportunity to start DevOps Days together with Patrick Dubois, and I kind of started the whole DevOps movement. And that's pretty much what we've been doing, um, helping people to deliver their software. What I'm going to talk about today is pretty much doing that. And it's called continuous delivery. It's called basically trying to build an infrastructure which is really fast, which is automated, which is deployed in a fast way, which is reproducible, consistent, and which is something you continuously want to do. Um, I said DevOps like five times already. Who knows what it is? OK, there, there's. 20 hands raising. So now I can pick one random guy in the audience and come up here and explain it to me. Just? Ah, just kidding. <laughs> That's the fun part. I know half of the audience, so I can actually pick at you guys. <laughs> um, somebody in the audience shouted clams. Um, that's right. I mean, there's a lot of definitions going on. And I still think that the one that summarizes DevOps the best is the CLAMS definition. It's about culture, it's about automation, it's about monitoring and measurement, and it's about sharing and security. And Damon Edwards and John Willis came up with that after they were interviewing a lot of people in their podcast called the DevOps Cafe. And they saw a recurring team with all the interviews they did. And that came out to be the CLAMS keyword. But the real question is, well, what's really in it for you? And that's when we come back to continuous delivery and all that stuff. It's about going faster to market. It's about pushing features to productions in hours or minutes, rather than months and years. I mean, just to show a quick, do a quick show of hands. Who's awake? Okay. Yeah, if you, if you do talks all over the world, you see people not responding even to who's awake because they're afraid to raise their hand. So I see you guys are awake. Who's currently shipping software in terms of months? Quarterly releases, yearly releases. Who's shipping software? For who does it take more than three months to ship a feature? Or for their team to ship a feature? Uh, 
and the Aristotel. And the Aristotel. <laughs> Who does it in less than an hour? Who doesn't know? Did you guys fall asleep again? <laughs> this is a Dutch audience, right? You guys should be like, yeah, the Germans are like. <laughs> okay, so we see a lot of organizations where there's basically six to nine months as a default, and they try to go to three months, they get, try to go to a faster release, they try to improve stability, they try to improve security, and eventually what we want to be is all be more happy. And there's, a, there's a good picture that I actually showed this in the next slide. And if you see a lot of the old school organizations are still taking waterfall when you think development. They say we're going to design something, we're going to put a bunch of architects in a corner, they're completely isolated from the real world, they've never touched a real system for the past five years because they're the architects. They draw something which is kind of close to reality six years ago. Um, then people start writing code, they don't talk to the people who run the operation platform, they have no clue what they're going to deploy on, they're probably building something for Red Hat 5. Um, or they might be actually building something for Fedora 24, you don't know. But probably not for the platform you're running, which is <coughs> They build something, this is like six months, this is like three months, this is like another nine months. This is the week before the deadline. <laughs> so that should be three months in their initial planning and they probably have like three days. And this is like Friday, 5 p.m. when they already announced it on national television. And then we go like, fuck, this doesn't work. So people figured out, well, there's the HR movement. We're gonna start to do development in sprints. So we're gonna try to do, basically we're gonna do a sprint where there's a bunch of analysis, design, building. It's like four sprints, two weeks, developers all crunching, writing code together. And then there's still that the week before the deadline, we're gonna do tests, and then there's the deploy and the aftercare, and still, still stuff isn't working because the agile people, and that's one of the critiques some people have against the agile movement is they forgot to include the ops people. I mean, that's probably you guys. So the next thing they do is, well, we're gonna actually get the operations people involved, and we're gonna do the testing and the deployment within one sprint. So now we have bi-weekly releases, we have different pipelines to point to different platforms, we have chaos, and now we go one step further. And we tell them no more branching, no more forks, you go feature flash, you turn on a feature on or off, and the platform, and we really test everything at every single commit. And when the test is successful, we deploy to production. And then people start becoming happy, and we start seeing the features being delivered in hours versus minutes. And it takes a real big change in mindset for those people. Now, I was talking about continuous delivery. I want to make out that DevOps and continuous delivery are two completely different things. They're related. But it's not because you're doing continuous delivery that you're actually having a great DevOps culture around, and not the other way around. You perfectly do continuous delivery. I do DevOps, have a really good culture, and really good automation without constantly pushing your code. There's also another important part. Is there's a lot of people who build a deployment pipeline with, a, with not even a single test in it. They're not doing continuous delivery, they're con doing continuous crashing. I mean, if you're constantly needing to update your software because it's crashing all the time and you don't have a test in place, well, what use is that for? So you need to do continuous integration, include testing in here, do continuous delivery, and when you really have mature tests, then you can say, well, every single commit, we don't have a human anymore checking if it's good, we're going straight to production because your test quality is high enough. That's kind of what Jess Humble described in his book. It's actually the back flap of the book, which is for a lot of people nirvana. This is where they want to go to. Like, we constantly deliver quality software. <coughs> and then there's the next thing. Over the past couple of years, there's been this part of my French dick measuring contest about how many times a day do you need to deploy it then. When Charles Bond uh, started this talk at Philosophy a couple of years ago, DevOps 10 deployed a day, it was like, 10 times a day at Flickr. And now there's people who say, we do 10,000 deploys. <coughs> like, we do more, we do more. Who cares? 
I mean, the whole point is not about how many times you can do it, it's about the fact that you are capable of doing it, and that you constantly know that you have a good building place. That you know that if on Wednesday evening there's a Drupal security issue, which is being pushed out in the world, that you know that within three hours, you've fixed it on your production site. And that is the value you're looking at. Not the fact that you have changed the CSV on that site, 20 times in the past three days. It's a fact that it isn't vulnerable. And the guys over at Etsy, when they released their tool deploying back in 2010, they actually put that in their readme. I was like, this is what you want to achieve. It's not about how many times, it's the fact that you can. So most of the things I say relate very well to software developers. And then there's this thing where I still don't get it that we've been trying to push software developers using tests, using quality gates, using a lot of things to allow them to, well, that piece of software, if you pass those, those, and those tests, we can put it to production. But those same people who've been telling those software developers to do that, they were the ones that they jumped into a box, modifying a file, restarting it, and then going back home. Those were the guys just randomly hacking the production, doing exactly what they refused the software developers to do. No, you're not going to modify that file on the platform, you're going to do, go to the CI pipeline. But by the way, I'm just going to modify this config file here and restart the service. Oh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> so why? It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> How about those network admins? How about those network admins? So who's doing software-defined networking here? What? <laughs> Couldn't you just have let it down and then I could have said, see, no hands. There was like one guy, cool. <laughs> At least somebody's thinking about it. And what about those network guys? What about those appliances with no APIs? We have the same problem. Um, in a lot of stacks, there are so many proprietary software that you cannot afford to have multiple stacks to test it on. But obviously, in a free software world, that's not really a problem. So continuous delivery, talking to a bunch of ops people, and they're like, yeah, so we do this with software. How do we start doing that with, with infrastructure, and why? Well, for me, the key value in starting to do this with your infrastructure <coughs> is that you need to learn how continuous delivery works. You need to learn how to build pipelines. You need to learn how to automate deployments in order to be able to support the people that are going to need to do that with their applications. If the developers come up to you and they say, hey, we've got this problem with Jenkins, you're like, what's Jenkins? <laughs> or similar things. If you don't know how the build system works, how can you expect people to listen to you if you say, we need to do continuous delivery? Yeah, but you're not doing it yourself. <clears throat> so you need to be able to understand what your, pe your peers are doing. You need to be able to support them. And you know, if you want them to do testing, you need to do, you need to be able to spin up an infrastructure. You need to be able to constantly, continuously update it anyhow, because it's a testing requirement. And you look at an infrastructure and there's infrastructure as code in the, in the world, and you, you need to build an infrastructure where there's the operating system, there's the middleware, and the databases and the application stack, and this is all fixed. Then you add an environment to that, you say this is development, this is acceptance, this is production. Those are config parameters. You might add some business rules to that, and you have some customer data. And if you do infrastructure as code, all of this is in version control, and this is the thing you need to back up. But you need to learn how to do that. You need to learn how to continuously build that code base. So we need to automate everything. We need to automate the build of our infrastructure. We need to test our infrastructure, and I'll come back to that later. And we need to do deployment of our infrastructure. So, this is a question I've been asking for the past decade to operations guys. Can you rebuild your infrastructure in about an hour? Who can rebuild this infrastructure in about an hour? One guy in the back, some people shaking, a couple of hours. Two hours. A week. Oh, a week is fine. Yeah. <laughs> It takes time to get hardware. There's an API for that. <laughs> so how do you start? Well, 
person control. As weird as it might sound, I know back in the early days when I was starting to work in 96, 97, I was telling two developers, we need to use version control. Yes, it was CBS back then, and we moved to Subversion, and slowly we moved to Git. Um, the developers, and I, well, I wish you had do that. And today I'm still having that same discussion with a bunch of ops guys. Why should we version our code? Why should we even version documentation, scripts, and config files? Well, that's because on the database cluster you have there, there's two not jail scripts, they both do a different check, and your A node is in failure and your B node is safe. And it's in the same state. Oh yeah, I modified that file somewhere, it didn't touch the other one. That's why you need version control. And so many other reasons, but that's another full stack. So we do version control, we do infrastructure as code, and when we do infrastructure as code, that means that we take a bunch of the development practices we learned from the software developers and we actually take them within our own infrastructure. We model the infrastructure so we have a bunch of common components and we have a bunch of deltas. And then we start testing that. We version that code, we test that code, we build checks that show that what we've written is actually successful, and we have development acceptance and production platforms which go in sync with the application that's being put on top of it. And then we come to the point where a working server is basically the combination of the application code, the infrastructure code, the tests which we reuse for monitoring, and security. But then we probably need to deal with proprietary appliances sometimes that don't really listen to what we want to do. The thing I want to give you guys is that infrastructure as code is not the same as having a Git repository full of bash scripts because people don't reuse those bash scripts. People just hack on top of them. Um, and also translating those bash scripts to YAML, that's not the same as infrastructure as code. Who got that joke? Who's using Ansible? Sorry. <laughs> There's one guy who finally gets it. Okay. So, we're doing software delivery. Our code for our infrastructure. What's one of the most challenging parts about doing software delivery? The most challenging part about software delivery? It's grouping the working components together. It's release management. It's figuring out which parts go into your build, what parts work together which component won't break if you use the other one. And we've seen that the software world has been trying to figure out that for themselves. They've been, in every single language, they figured out a way to do that. They've got pom files in Java, they've got um, Bundler in, in Ruby, they've got um, Composer in Symfony, they've got, there's so many variants of them. And basically what they all do is, got a version, I've got a file with a list of versions, and those together map to one thing. So I'm going to show you an example. On the right side, there's a Puppet file, which basically is a link to a Nginx module, a Git reference with an upstream pointer to where it is on GitHub, and the Git hash. And there's a lot. This could be another version, this could be another location, this could be, if you're in the Puppet ecosystem, could be a pointer to uh, Puppet Forge. But basically it's this tool, that location, that version. And if you look at Compose or if you look at Ruby Gems, they're all kind of similar things. And none of them work. You see the thing on the left? Kind of looks exactly the same. Location, well, it's cut up, but you see where locations are, what the remotes are, git hash, and the name. What tool is the left one? It's git, it's baby. It's a tool everybody else is already using. And I know people look weird at me when I'm saying this, but to me the solutions to software release management is using git submodules. You build a tree with references to all the modules you need, whether it's with Java, Python, Drupal, Puppet, whatever, doesn't matter. You build that tree, you have the references in Git, and you don't need another tool. We've been building UIs on top of that with pull-down lists where 
this version will predominate APIs and it's really already there. You just need to get over the hassle of understanding all the Git submodule works and then suddenly stuff becomes really easy. So now we have a project tree where you have a bunch of code. I'm going to use Puppet as an example for doing continuity, but you can do similar things with, well, we've done similar things with uh, Ansible. We've done similar things with Drupal. We've done similar things with Symfony, with Java projects. They work. So now you need to build something. So you need a tool for that. Um, we've been using Jenkins for quite a while now. There's a bunch of others. We're slowly running into the limitations of Jenkins, being the fact that what we want to do is doing infrastructure as code and completely automatically deploying a Jenkins instance is really painful. But for most of you, you'll probably get there. And then we start building a pipeline. And the important thing with a pipeline is that you need to keep it green. So you check your code in, you get feedback, the build and unit has failed, so you go back, you fix the feedback, and you try again. So that's green. And then you have some more tests. You go back, you check in the code again until it's green. I've seen way too many teams, and specifically mainframe people, who think continuous delivery and continuous integration is fine if they fix something here and then push it through and don't do all the other tests anymore. Awesome. You've just pushed push something to production, but they have absolutely no clue what. So a good pipeline looks like green, 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 green. And you get a visual overview of the state of your code, and you get a visual overview of what happened. And you see there's 3 to 8 seconds. These are more heavy tests. But in about two minutes, your code is being pushed through, and it's actually being tested. And that's usually much less time than making a typo, doing it manually, going back to your coffee machine and realizing, oh, fuck, I need to do it again. You can still go to the coffee machine if you haven't broken production. Like I said, when you try to automate Jenkins, you want to clone pipelines, you want to build pipelines, you want to build on top of that, it's get difficult, but we're looking into a lot of alternatives there. There's still like the Jenkins Job Builder, there's the Job DSL. Um, I mentioned them, but they're probably worth a complete other talk on that topic. So you build a pipeline, you need to figure out what's in your pipeline. And usually it starts like this. Check out the code, you do syntax checks on them, you do style checks on them. If you don't all use the same style, people are going to look at the code and say, whoa, obfuscated Perl. And then the other one gets like, hey, a little presentation. And by the end of the day, you, your eyes are completely screwed. So you do all of these tests, and then you do more tests, and then you package it. Um, there's a couple of reasons why I want to package. Because package managers, and I mean operating system package managers, I don't want to talk about um, the Python packages, the Ruby packages, uh, Ruby gems, and PyPy, and all that stuff. That's not a package, that's um, shrink wrap junk. But an operating system package just gives me all these features. It gives me consistency. I can trace where a file is coming from. I can put dependencies in there. And I can trace on my platform, there's three types of files. There's a file that's one package. There's a file which is managed by config management, and then there's user-generated data. And when I need to care, take care of my backups, the only thing I care about is the user-generated data, because all the other parts are already in version control. You also want to package for a bunch of other reasons, like you don't really have access to GitHub when you build stuff. Uh, you're in a weird location and you need to ship stuff on CDs. And we were hailing packages like ages ago because nobody liked to write a rules file or a spec file. But if you're building stuff internally, there's a really, really good tool that does that. FPM, Jordan CSL's fucking package manager, pretty much takes any of these. And those are really needed because then you can actually package them. And outputs them to <coughs> system reports. These are not packages you're going to get upstream in a distro, but they're more than good enough to use in your own repositories. So if you see this guy, thank him not only for FPM, but for all the other stuff he wrote. Um, and when, when I briefly mentioned 
you want to do continuous delivery, you want to stop doing branches, you want to work on master only, I kind of didn't really like because we don't use branches, but making it a package is actually a snapshot. It's an immutable branch which you're going to deploy. So you've created two things here. You've created a point in time where you say, this is something we're going to deploy. I can deploy that over and over again. It's an artifact. And I can trace that artifact through my pipeline. I can now upload it to a repository. And from that repository, I can deploy it in other places. So who would like him to manage repositories? Who manages an apt or a repository here? Who's downloading stuff straight from the internet? Curl Pi Shell? So repository management is something really difficult. Um, after trying this stuff for years, we, we still see that we, we are not really great at it. There, there's a bunch of tools that are helping us out there. These are mostly from um, our PM ecosystem. Um, Aptly is working great to do stuff for the Apt ecosystem, but I haven't got the time yet to really spend time with Aptly yet. But one of the things with Pulp is we used to have a bunch of scripts that mirrored tens and dozens of upstream repositories. And people were running those scripts from Chrome, and they were not working, and they were hackerish, and we were using a bunch of third-party tools that were basically, it was a mess. And Pulp kind of, Pulp is part of the uh, Red Hat ecosystem. What they build is a stack that allows you to manage repositories locally, not having 10 copies of the same file on disk, even if there are 10 repositories that use it. It saves you in time, it saves you in disk space, and it's, even with some negative issues, I mean, the stability is gone, that was in the early days. Um, it's a really nice tool to build a workflow like this one. So what we do in a couple of environments is there's the wild internet. And I mean, I love all of these guys, but sometimes they do fun stuff. They move their repositories around. They rename the upstream location of the repository. And they remove a file from the repository. So if, if my build depends on that upstream repository, and those guys decide to move their repository from repository.whatever to yum.whatever, my build is broken. So what I do is I use pulp to mirror these all locally. That's my local copy. And then I have a point in time for development, I have a point in time for acceptance, I have a point in time for production. So I need three more repositories. These are the sendos repositories. I need to have three copies of those repositories. In the old days, without pulp, that would mean I have a lot of disk space. With pulp, it manages that in back. And then I take a group of packages where there's upstream, and I cherry pick packages from Evil, G package, Puppet Labs, whatever, and I put them in my upstream repositories. And those also have a workload to development to production. Then there's sometimes a bunch of packages where we say, look, that one is really good, but that dependency, we don't really need it, so I'm going to repackage it. This is really the custom rebuilds from the upstream, not having those around anymore that much. And then there's the software you build internally. So there's two, three sets of repositories which you need to manage, but depending on the number of environments you have, they multiply. If you're using a tool like Puppet or Chef, you can now say, well, I have full control over my repository. So I always want the latest package that's available for me to be installed. Um, you can have a pipeline which does the application you're needing to support, which just push it into the repository and then triggers a yum update or an apt update. Post-install might need to reinstall, the restart or so. But together with that, you also have a repository where you say, I'm going to spin up a new machine that needs to be installed to get the latest version correctly from that repository. So if you spin up a machine in development, it's going to get the latest development version in development. If you spin up in production, you're not going to get the latest development version. You're going to get the one from production because you have control of the repositories you use. Why am I saying that? Because there's a lot of people in the software delivery world who say, hey, we're going to have a deployment framework which is going to just update, 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 deploy. I forget to put it in your repository. So when you spin up a new machine and it doesn't deploy from your package repository, you're like five versions behind from what you actually delivered from the delivery infrastructure. 
which is painful. So you upload it into the repository, <coughs> then you deploy it on test. So yeah, we do a short loop. We basically upload it to the repository and parallelly deploy it because uploading it, generating metadata is slow, pulling in metadata again is also slow, so we shortcut that, but still we want to be able to reboot set the boxes. If you want to manage more than 100 nodes, more than 1,000 nodes, you need to think about using these tools. If you do this from a pipeline, if you want to deploy, for example, to 10 Puppet Monsters, the same code base, because then you have solved your scalability problem, you want to deploy those packages simultaneously, and you can use tools like Collective or Ansible to do those deployments. Um, when you talk about orchestration, people go like, yeah, but we also need to think about if I have an application that I need to have a database first before I can deploy my application. And that we're figuring out all kinds of new tools to figure that out. I don't think you need new tools for that. I think you need to talk to your developers and make their application more resilient. You need to re-architect what you're doing. Because if during runtime the database failed, they need to take care of that also. So what they need to do is launch an application. Do I have a database? No, it's not there yet. Now wait. Oh, it's there. Does the database in there create? No. Oh, let's use Liquidate or use something else to do version scheming and actually update the database if it's there. I mean, the, the, the days when we were powering on full records machines where we were actually talking to the API about power management supply, say, power on this machine first, wait 30 seconds, then power on this one, and like, we saw the links, the, the blinking lights starting to ping in, in time series, like, wait five minutes. Okay, now put on the other ones. That's a software problem which you need to solve on another part. And if you're thinking about a microservice architecture, we're not going to wait till all the nodes are up and running. We're just going to make sure that there's an endpoint and wait till that endpoint is available. So we are check if you start thinking about using those kind of tools. So we've uploaded it to a repository. How much time do we have? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Whoa. Okay. Uh, is that without five minute delay or bit? <laughs> uh, it's like, oh, we're fine. Anyhow, it's going to be huge, huge anytime. So, we deployed stuff, put it into repository, and we need to start testing our stuff. And there's a bunch of people who say you need to write the unit tests for your infrastructure as code, you need to do stuff like service spec, you need to write R spec code for um, your puppet code. Daniel, what's the latest news on testing chef code? Inspect, I think? Yeah, inspect. So, you need to run that in your pipeline. And then there are the other people who say, well, you can write a lot of tests, but as long as you're not actually checking the state of the service you deployed, like if you're running a web server and it's listen on port 80 and actually use those fee hosts and accept data there, I mean, even if all of your unit tests are fine, if you're getting an error on the URL you're trying to configure, it's wrong. So put more effort in actually writing the checks for the infrastructure. So there's two fields. I think you need to be somewhere in the middle, but I still prefer to first drive a lot of the health checks for my infrastructure and do that with tools like Ikinga or, well, whatever poison you want. Um, the thing with monitoring your infrastructure is that if you have having a legacy, bloated, expensive proprietary stack, you're only going to have one instance. <coughs> so you cannot afford to do two. And making one change in that infrastructure also is going to be a three month delay before somebody wants to manually log on to that HP OpenView console and, and change stuff. Um, and if you're doing infrastructure as code, you want to benefit from that and basically generate <coughs> the configuration for your monitoring stack based on the code you just wrote. So if I define a web server which a vhost is being exported, I'm going to take that definition and use that in my monitoring system to actually also check it. So we started doing that. We started actually having an infrastructure like that. And I was but how long are we going to wait for the king to turn red after the deploy? Because it might actually take its async. So we started triggering on our development environment. We started using Ansible to trigger puppetrons faster and then to trigger um, <coughs> the king checks. <coughs> Sorry. We figured out the load of our system grew way too fast <laughs> because of too many SSH connections, because of too many Ansible jobs running. So we're figuring out how to do the best. Um, currently, there's a subset we check on a chain that it's, it's still OK. So these tests we write 
they're reusable in production because they're the exact same tests. Um, they increase the stability. And they also make that we have a test environment for a monitoring platform. We have a test environment and an acceptance platform for a monitoring platform. So we really want to change that. We see that through the development of our workflow. It also brings to the point that, well, developers now also need to take care of what they write. Because it might not be the code we write to deploy the infrastructure that's going to break my monitoring system. It might also be their application. So your development team now is also looking at their dashboards to make sure that their services are still running. And they get visibility on that because you've automated the creation of your monitoring system. And it's not like the extra chore you need to do to make that work. And you also learn behaviors. You get a feedback of much easier, much further, much deeper with your developers, like, hey, so why is that database suddenly getting a load, and why are they just getting like a zillion more database queries? Oh, that's because of that code change from a couple of hours ago, not from six months ago. So we deploy on tests, we trigger a bunch of puppet runs, or, sorry, or shape. Um, we check a thing out and then we promote. And we, we, for a long time, and we're still figuring out ways around it, we basically, after we deployed to production, do UAT, we send out a mail using the Jenkins Promote Build plugin saying, hey, look, I've deployed this. If, if you're happy, click here, and then the next stage goes. Um, we're really struggling today with the Jenkins Promote Build plugin because it's internally really a mess. It's a bunch of Jenkins job inside a Jenkins job. It's XML inside XML, and it's really pretty much none of the tools that support all the main engines support the Promote Build plugin. So we're refactoring a bunch of those pipelines. Um, but it's still something which is allowing you to send out mails to say, hey, this check this, and if you have like three votes, we go further, we deploy to production. It's a mechanism that will give people much more comfort in what they're doing than all the main So in a way, it's a stage you need to go through to go to a higher maturity level. So we promote it to an acceptance platform. We build stuff there, we test stuff there. There's a lot more tests. This is, for example, where you want to do security tests, where you want to use tools like Gauntlet, where you want to do uh, a bunch of those tools and actually scan your infrastructure for security. You want to break it there. And then we want to move further. Then we want to move to production. So are we done yet? No, because I want to send metrics when I do deployments. I want to be able to close that feedback loop. This is a really nifty hack. Um, no, I took the wrong slide. What's wrong with this slide? It's not going to work on all Linux systems. So basically, you echo it to the port, but the FTCP is not going to work everywhere. That's the only thing. This is actually a CentOS variant. It's not going to work on all the systems. Um, so what we do is we use Graphite for that. Um, Graphite collects metrics from pretty much every component of our infrastructure, but we also send deploy metrics. This is the point in time where we deploy an application. This is the point in time where we update a part of the infrastructure. And it allows us to pretty much take the graphs of the infrastructure and put vertical lines on the events and see what happened. So now the developers can see, hey, we deployed, whether it's infrastructure code or our application code, at 3 a.m. this afternoon, did this morning, and we see the same loss in traffic. Oh, we know what deploy cost it, because we measured it. So now we have no more hacking in production, no more, I'm gonna quickly change this, and we have no more, well, we just spun up 10 bucks and then we don't have monitoring for that. And we have a bunch of much more happy operations guys who sleep at night and only get call out of their beds on the customers that don't have these practices in place at your time. And that's actually the reality. I think I actually managed to do it in time. Kind of. We have a little bit of time to ask uh, a few questions. Questions. In the back. You should take on, on immutable infrastructure. Now you assume that you are 
zero and that's the day that's a new code. But uh, I do it, I just replace the virtual machine with a new one with a new code. So the question is what's my take on the immutable infrastructure because I go about the point where I take a machine and I update that machine while it's running and the person in the back says I just take a machine and replace it with a new running instance. Uh, my take on immutable infrastructure is I love it. Um, I would really like to see us move forward there where, but the reality is that if I look at the current landscape of application development uh, at customers where I work with and at other people I talk to, there's probably about 2% like, of people who know how to build stateless applications which are capable of being short-lived and which you can deploy in containers. And there's 98% of people who are just writing code which writes locally to disk, who has no clue about state, who currently is not ready to do that yet. And we're, we're, when I was talking about building high available clusters and high available stacks, the, the first discussion we always had with application developers, where is your state and how do I make access to your data redundant? So that was a really difficult discussion and we still didn't find a magic ball to build a high, high available application there. Then we started moving to the cloud and you know how fast Amazon machines disappear and how we need to treat the infrastructure there. Uh, who's in the cloud here? The same guy who lost the immutable infrastructure question <laughs> and three other hands. Um, so we're still teaching people how to do that. It's taking a while. And now we're going to a mutual infrastructure. And for those use cases where that's possible, absolutely. But what I do use then to build the containers for the actual immutable boxes I run is exactly the same code that I use now to spin up working machines. I run Puppet Apply on the code base I already have to build a container. So for those 2% of use cases that I see currently that are capable of doing that, do it. But they need to be short-lived, immutable, and they don't need to have state. And when you have the other spectrum around, where there's only 2% of the people who really are doing stuff with state, with large databases, with all those stuff, then we'll be happy. But I'm thinking I'm going to be on the South American island with Mad Dog by the time that happens. Thank you, uh, Chris. Let's uh, do other questions in the well in the, in the break. Uh, if you have any for uh, for him, uh, well, we don't have uh, maybe a good beer, but we have uh, stroopwafels. Yeah, my so, uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you.